So I want to touch two topics this week, um, Qumran and the, Sud the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, and w w we'll define the terms as we go along. But let me first tell you, I basically want to look at Qumran and the canon. We'll discuss what, briefly, that word pseudepigrapha means. It's a $20 word that does have some value, and we will come back to it later in the course. And I'm going to ask the same question they asked last week. Well, why would I bother reading this stuff? Well, let me start with Qumran, which, as you can see here, is the location where the Dead Sea Scrolls were identified, were located. It's a fascinating detective story, but that would take us too far afield. If you're ever interested in mysteries and political intrigue and backdoor deals and things like that, get a copy of Yigal Yadin's book on the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's really interesting. For our purposes, something like 150 years before Jesus was born, a group of Jewish leaders became disgusted with what they saw was the corruption and impurity of the Jerusalem priesthood. And so they decided to get out of town. And so they moved here down by the Dead Sea, in the middle of nowhere. And they established a little community where they would be free to be as pure a follower of the Lord and the Torah as they could be. And so they flourished for 150, 200 years. Dating's not exact. But we do know that around the time that the Romans stepped in to crush the Jewish rebellion, they could see that things would not end well. So they took a bunch of their library books, stuck them in jars, and up in these caves, like here and up here and up here, they stuffed the caves in the back. They stuffed the jars in the back of the caves figuring maybe we'll come back to get them as soon as things calm down. And they headed for the hills themselves. Well, almost 2,000 years went by, and none of them ever came back. But in 1947, somebody who was looking for a missing goat happened, instead of finding the goat, happened to find one of these jars. And that kicked off a whole archaeological campaign here and elsewhere. And there were a stack of books, scrolls, that were discovered in 1947 and following. And another long story took decades to get these translated and published. But a large body of literature that has really given us tremendous insight into both Judaism and the origins of Christianity. Some of this stuff relates directly to the canon, and that's what I want to primarily focus on. However, not all the books that were found there were Bible books. there is a stack of scrolls that they wrote themselves that they didn't pretend were Bible books. They described the rules and regulations of their community, recorded prophecies of what they thought would happen in the future, and there are a couple of now large translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I prefer Florentino Garcia Martinez's translation, which is a nice, convenient, one-volume paperback. Uh, I won't give you a, uh, a reading out of this, though I probably should have. Um, but this gives you an idea of what these looked like. These were 
scrolls made of parchment sewn together where the animal skin ended and Hebrew text and Hebrew text and Hebrew text. So a book like this tells us an awful lot about the community that was there. As I said, a separatist community, part of the Second Temple Judaism pluralism of Judaism. So these weren't Pharisees. They might have been Essenes. We're not 100% certain. But they were a sectarian community that had specific beliefs about the Torah and the like. What does this tell us about the canon? Well, it tells us a number of things about the state of the canon from 100 BCE to 68 CE, just before, again, Jerusalem was wrecked and Masada, several years later, was captured. In their view, prophecy had not ceased. There is an idea circulating in other Jewish circles that prophecy stopped with the time of Ezra and the return from the exile. <coughs> These people didn't necessarily believe that. And this tells us again that in the Second Temple period, just because an idea appears doesn't mean everybody immediately buys it. You know, how many times if you have somebody visit from another country and they ask you, well, what do Americans think about Da -da. Well, you know what you think. You know what your friends think. But for a lot of issues, what you think is not necessarily what everybody else in America thinks. And this was very much the case in Second Temple Judaism. What we also do know for certain in their community is that we found copies of all of the various Hebrew Bible books except for Esther. Now, the lack of Esther is not an accident. See, if it was just a matter of we didn't find a copy of Esther, well, maybe we might find one when they assemble all the thousands and thousands of fragments that are there. And actually, they're now beginning to use AI and matching algorithms to begin to piece these together because they're just, there's so many of them, there's no way we can figure out those jigsaw puzzles on our own. But the reason we don't expect to find a copy of Esther is because Esther is never mentioned in any of the documents, like in this big book. See, there's a question about whether Nehemiah was there, but Nehemiah's referenced. Esther probably conflicts with their ideology at some point and probably has to do with calendar and ritual. Since it doesn't fit their system, well, it's not biblical. So, their canon is 95% the same as the later Hebrew canon. Now, as far as the, st the standing of that um, canon canonical development, they spoke of the Torah and the prophets much like they do in the New Testament. And that tells you that the Torah, the first five books, that's closed. That's it. That's done. The prophets are close to being closed, but not quite, because to finally close the prophets, you really separate out the writings from the prophets, and the prophets are one group, and the writings are another. That hasn't happened here. Daniel and the Psalms 
are part of the prophets. The Psalms? Uh, don't, don't wonder too badly about that. When Peter is preaching his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2.30, he refers to David prophesying about Jesus, and what he's quoting is one of the Psalms. So this idea that the Psalms could be viewed as a prophetic book is not squarely. It's just not the way the rabbis finally codified the collection later. And, yeah. Collection, yeah. Ah. Okay, do we have statements in the Qumran materials that tell us who are these prophets? Well, the prophecies they're referring to are not necessarily prophecies of the future. They're referring to the various prophetic books, to Daniel, or to viewing David as a prophet, not because he's predicting the future, but because he's speaking on behalf of God. Because as he's composing the Psalms, these praises and the like are inspired by God. But we're not seeing like a, a new uh, prophetic character like uh, an Elisha. Or, okay. Or, or, or another prophet. Yes. Well, the closest they come to that kind of prophetic figure is their teacher of righteousness, who is kind of the leader of the community. And part of the issue there is that the teacher of righteousness appears to be a teacher and does prophecies, but he's primarily a priest. And in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, prophets and priests are different roles. But they don't, when speaking of some of the books and the like, they don't necessarily think that the gift of prophecy has ceased. Yes, yes. So the idea that there is this 400-year gap between the end of the Hebrew Bible and the beginning of the Christian Bible is an idea the rabbis would have found congenial, but is not an idea the Qumran covenanters would have, would have believed. They, they did speak often about the activity of the Spirit in their community. Now, part of the reason we think that so the collection is not closed is because the Psalms themselves don't appear to be a finalized book. If you look at the various Psalms manuscripts, the book, the, the book we have of Psalms is divided into five books. So if you look in your English Bible, you'll see book one, book two, obviously inspired by the Pentateuch, by the Torah. The order and text of the first three books appears to be solid at Qumran. But books four and five, the numbering is somewhat different. And we have several extra psalms which are appended, which didn't make the final cut. So they're still editing the hymnal. I mean, if you think about the psalms, it's not a book written by David a thousand years ago. It's a hymnal. It's called the book of David in some respects because he has some of the most important chapters in it. But the editing of the hymnal is not quite finished. Now, part of what you have at the Qumran community are books that are not found in the Hebrew Bible. 
There are a couple of fragments of apocryphal works, like the Wisdom of Sirach that we looked at last week. There are multiple copies of the books of Jubilees and of First Enoch. These are books which they didn't necessarily look at as scripture, but they were books that they highly prized as ways to interpret scripture. Jubilees is almost like a commentary on the Hebrew Bible from a ritual perspective. Now, mentioning Jubilees and Enoch brings me to the other half of what we want to talk about today, and that's the pseudepigrapha. What? Pseudepigrapha is a $20 word, which refer, I should make that a $100 word these days, it's been inflation. Um, drawn from two Greek words, which mean false title or false ascription. What it means is this is a book which at one point claims to be written by Tom, but was actually written by Francis. Now, we may not know who Francis or Mary or George or whoever was, was the real author, but we know it wasn't Tom. So it's something written under another person's name, and even in the modern world, this can range anywhere from somebody writing under a pen name or using an unnamed ghostwriter, all the way down to a, a rank forgery. I mean, imagine somebody in the middle of next year's election season announces that they found this long-lost letter from Donald Trump which says that abortion is a woman's right and conservative Christians are idiots and rich people need to pay more taxes. Or a long-lost letter from Joe Biden saying that he needs to advocate for abolishing all abortions under all conditions and kicking out the radical communists from the party and giving more tax breaks to corporations. The obvious reason those suddenly discovered letters appear is because they alienate the candidate from their base. They're intended to make the person look bad. They're obviously rank forgeries. Those couldn't have been done because they wished the candidate well. Okay? We'll talk about this in two weeks. Well, in this, the stuff that we're going to be looking at is mostly material which is not a forgery in the sense of wanting to darken somebody's name. Most of these appear to be other environments where people are placing ideas from the present in the mouth of somebody from the past. Now, this can be, uh, and there's a whole literature going back to this. One possible reason is if you do accept the idea that prophecy has ceased with the ancients, one way to get around that is to place the current story in the mouth of somebody who lived years and years ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, as I said, we'll discuss this further, you know, further on, but yeah. And sometimes their case is better than others. But yeah, that's, that's an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, if you do believe something 
is written after the fact, then you view it differently. Now, whether you completely reject it or not, again, that, that's another story for another day. Now, a hundred or more years ago, there was a clear, hard and fast line between the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. Scholarship has not been very kind to that strict distinction. And I know when I was preparing this particular slide, I went through multiple versions of it, trying to figure out, well, how do I explain this? And I figured out the reason I couldn't explain it is because it really was a distinction without a difference. Because really, the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha are overlapping collections. It's really the same body of ancient Jewish Second Temple literature. The basic difference is a very practical one. These are documents not found in the Hebrew Bible. They're not found in the Talmud. They're not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the distinction is where you will find the books. And so what I've basically given you is a search algorithm. If the book is in the Apocrypha, well, you pull out a study Bible. If you suspect the book might be Apocrypha or might be Pseudepigrapha, this is the first place to look because the list is much shorter. If the book isn't in the Bible and isn't in here, in the Apocrypha, in the reference Bible, Then it's in one of these two books, basically. Now, when you look at this and realize I'm also going to go back to the Apocrypha in a moment, there's a lot of stuff here. I was thinking, well, maybe I should throw in a slide which says, here are the six different categories or four different categories of what's in here. And the more I looked at that, the more I realized it would suck up so much time that basically I tell you about the collection and you'd never see any of it. So I'm not going to get into a big discussion about what kinds of literature are in there because a lot of those have technical terms and I'd have to explain what this is or what that is. Not my primary concern here. The one other thing that I wanted to say about this before we move any further is that these are books that are not preserved by later Judaism. The rabbis look back on this writing and they see that this writing was nothing but pain for Israel. The ideas in here brought trouble, destruction. So they basically left this aside, and in their re-envisioning of what Judaism is from 70 onward to, say, 200 or 300, they just left this material in the rearview mirror. They're developing material in the Talmud, the Mishnah first, and then the Talmud commentary on the Mishnah they're just going in a completely different direction. They're focused on how is the Torah telling me how to live my life and obey my laws for ritual and ethical purity. The ideas about God's triumph and end of the world and the reign of God and the end times, no. That created the destruction of the, of the temple in Jerusalem. Christians, however, grow out of this soil. So they don't believe everything in there, but these are the beliefs that early Christians started from, ideas that Jesus builds on in his proclamation of the kingdom of God. 
So Christians had interest in this material because they could see it reflected the kind of worldview that they started from. So it's Christians who preserve this Jewish literature, not the Jews. Now the reason you would read this material is the same set of reasons that you would read the Apocrypha. There are some interesting pieces on their own. We'll look at two pieces that you could actually read devotionally. A number of these pieces are critical in understanding the New Testament. We'll see some parallels in a few minutes. But this material is, if you will, less curated than most of the Apocrypha. So the Apocrypha is kind of a sliver of more the cream of the literature. The pseudepigrapha is just all the milk that came in the bucket from the cow. The Apocrypha is kind of the cream, some of the cream that was skimmed off the top. The Apocrypha is just the milk and cream straight as it came out of the, out of the udder. The pseudepigrapha, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he has affinities with that, yes. Yes. Do we see any references by John the Baptist of any of the pseudepigrapha? I do know Right. I see a bunch of other pseudepigrapha in there. Sure. And apocryphal. Yeah, sure. Do we see any John the Baptist reference any of those material? We don't see John the Baptist referencing any of this. I think. I'll bring out a couple of the New Testament parallels in a minute, and I think that might answer your question as to what, to what we might know about that. Um, as far as I know, the only things we know about John the Baptist are in the New Testament. Okay. So, so you know, these guys aren't, you know, uh, even Moses and all those guys. No, okay. no. They actually, if you... Oh, yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you actually visit Qumran, you'll see that they had this elaborate cistern system set up because these people took two ritual baths a day. You're in the middle of one of the driest deserts that you can find. How on earth these people had 10 swimming pools. Where we would look at them as swimming pools. They were mikvot. They were ritual baths. They developed a cistern system to grab all the runoff from the rainy season and store it for the rest of the year so they had water for two-a-day baths for a community of 100, 200 people. As I said, there were 10 of these ritual baths that I, I have pictures of. I was incredible engineering feat. So I passed out some handouts. And let me look at these passages with you at least quickly. I mean, guess, well, I guess we have about half an hour. And I did hear like I did with the Apocrypha. I tried not to just pick the really good, or the really ugly, or just the nee, who cares stuff that you know would put you to sleep. I tried to select uh, different pieces that have different, that tell you different things about this literature. The first two examples from the life of Adam and Eve and Jubilees, uh, I picked the life of Adam and Eve because I've seen this in the table of contents of 
uh, the other Bible and other more popular pieces that um, advocate for people you know, reading or uh, adopting maybe these particular pieces. These two books illustrate the way people in the pseudepigraphal books tried to fill in the gaps of the Old Testament. One of the things that you see if you study the Hellenistic and Roman periods as I did, the Hellenistic and Roman worlds and the classical world of Athens as well, these are very different worlds from the era of the patriarchs, the exodus, the judges in the Hebrew world, or very different from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. It's just a completely different culture. It's like the difference between the 1890s Wild West and modern-day Manhattan, New York City. I mean, it's, they just would not understand it. One is just really, it's crass and brutal and violent in ways that modern upper crust Americans just, you know, reject. So part of what you see when people read this literature in that time period is they see that these people didn't think quite the way they did. And so there are multiple strategies they use to try to bridge the cultural gap between now and back then. And one of the ways they try to fill this in is by literally filling in the story. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, you don't see much about angels. You see nothing to speak of about the afterlife. When Joseph is lost, thrown in the pit, devoured by the beasts or whatever the story was, when Jacob sees the torn coat, he mourns and says, I am going to go down gray hair to my grave weeping for my lost son. He doesn't say, oh, when I die, I'll see Joseph again. It's just, I'm going to die. I'm never going to see my son again. My heart is broken. I am devastated. So, if he does think there is a land of shadows where he goes, he's not going to recognize anybody down there. There's not the hope of a resurrection this early. And certainly there's no discussion of angels and the like, and this we'll come to in Jubilees in a moment. So the life of Adam and Eve fills in some of these gaps In chapter 32, and by the way, the preface that I, I put in here uh, explains how Moses, who wasn't around when Adam and Eve lived, this is how Moses got the story. And if you notice, it was teaching by the archangel Michael. So there's this intermediary who's teaching apparently people found it difficult to imagine that god directly would instruct somebody over time eve is prompted by an angel to rise up from her repentance you don't see adam and eve grieving and repenting after their sin in the garden. You know, the story just keeps going. And she's to rise up so that she could see Adam's spirit born up to meet its, meet its maker. And in this next chapter, which you can read on your own, the angel takes Adam, brings him up to, if you notice, in 37.5, 
brings him up to paradise to the third heaven and leave him there until that great and fearful day which I am about to establish for the world. So the idea of a third heaven is clearly in this time period. So when Paul refers to that in 2 Corinthians 12, nobody would be shocked at what he was saying. Yes, this fulfills the same function as the Midrashim in Judaism, where you're filling in gaps, making explanations for how some of this stuff happens. It's just the interpretive strategy is somewhat different. In, um, somewhat different, but not completely different. The business... Yes, yes, very Joseph Smith, right. And so the creating religious fiction to fill in gaps is not a new idea. So is that why they're calling it the pseudo-syncopus? Yeah, because this... So they're attributing it to Moses in the past? Yeah, they're attributing it to Moses in the past. And so while it's on one side, some manuscripts call it the life of Adam and Eve, this preface tells you this was an apocalypse, a revelation to Moses. But of course it's written in a variety of Greek that Moses would never have been able to know. Oh, that's, yeah, that's exactly why. Uh, many or most are, though some of them may have had a Semitic origin. It depends on the particular work. Uh, the ones that originate in Greek are all in a Hellenistic Greek which is not in any way, shape, manner, or form the Greek I read when I read the Odyssey. Um, it's How does that compare with the Greek? Well, the Koine Greek is very much what you would have in the life of Adam and Eve and the like. So if you're writing a reader, yeah, if you're writing a reader for students and you want them to read something that's not in the Bible so they don't have their memory verses intruding on their translations. You want to see if they really know what they're talking about. I, I've given examples of things like this on a Greek test because this is the same dialect, but it's not the same content. Homer's Greek is... Um, the word formations are different. Not completely. I didn't need a year to learn how to read Homeric Greek. But I needed several weeks in the beginning of a graduate class in order to get up to speed with it. Yes, yes. Homer is about the era of David and, um, and Solomon. Athens is about the time of the exile, or actually the restoration from the 400s. And those are two different dialects of Greek that you don't see in most of the pseudepigrapha. The angel theme is really picked up in Jubilees. I was reading John Chrysostom's sermons on Genesis as part of my graduate work, um, translating, because there wasn't an English translation of them. And one of the points that John Chrysostom points out is nothing in Genesis talks about anything spiritual. Genesis 1 only talks about the creation of the physical world. Well, John Chrysostom wasn't the only person to notice that issue. The author of the book of Jubilees noticed the problem. Chrysostom basically said Jews in Israel at the very beginning weren't ready to hear about the spirit world. So God didn't talk about that. Well, in Jubilees, they decide to fill in what Genesis didn't tell you. So in addition to the first day where he created the heavens above, the earth below, the waters he also created the spirits who ministered before him, the angels of the presence, the angels of sanctification, the angels of the spirit of fire, all of this angelic hierarchy. 
comes out of this time period. And then it goes on to mention that there are garments of skin and dress them, and it's commanded in the heavenly tablets to all who will know the judgment of the law that they should cover their shame and not be uncovered as the Gentiles are uncovered. Okay, well, Moses is writing this in the era of the Egyptians, and he's referencing Greek, yet yeah, not just referencing Gentiles, but he's referencing Gentile gymnasia, where you exercise naked, the gymnas gymnasium. Yes, yes, the whole Olympics, yeah, yeah, where you're, again, you're competing naked. Uh, Moses isn't aware of that. Although, I guess if you work within this structure, God could have revealed this to Moses, in which case one has to ask, why would Moses write it down because it's so irrelevant to anything he would know? Later in chapter 4, it introduces you to the Watchers, about two-thirds way down that chapter. The Watchers are a class of super angels. If you go back to Genesis chapter 6 and look at the sons of God, the Nephilim, you look at a commentary like my old professor at Asbury University, Vic Hamilton, put in his um, New International Commentary in the Old Testament. He will tell you that there are three options for interpreting what these Nephilim are, and he's not going to hazard a guess as to which one is definitively right, because it's a really confusing passage. Jubilees has no doubts about what that passage is. It's about these angels fathering children by mortal women. There's another example in chapter 15 of talking about a Maccabean problem back in Moses' voice because the description that they have here in chapter 15 where sons of Israel will apostatize from the faith and not circumcise their children, imperfectly circumcise them so they're less obvious to the Gentiles, or as 1 Maccabees 1 will tell you, there was a thriving business in plastic surgery in Jerusalem, where men sought out ways to reverse circumcision so they wouldn't be embarrassed in the gymnasium. And Jubilees is particularly attractive to the Qumran community because this kind of stuff is an example of just how debased they thought people in Jerusalem were. So there were people in Jerusalem who did fall into this trap. And so those people who make themselves like the Gentiles to be removed and uprooted from the land, I'm in the last three lines of the paragraph, and there is therefore for them no forgiveness or pardon, so they might be pardoned and forgiven from all the sins of this eternal error. This is the unpardonable sin. Forget it. Now, let me go from the fill in the gaps and speculate on the angels and that hierarchy stuff to the prayer of Manasseh, which is pseudepigraphical because there's no evidence that the wicked king Manasseh ever repented in the Old Testament. Somebody in the, Old Te somebody in the, in the uh, Second Temple period thought he should have. And if he had, what would he have said? Well, he would have said something like the prayer of Manasseh. 
But in contrast to a whole bunch of angelic speculations, if you read this, it's hard to argue with. Uh, in one of the introductions to the Apocrypha, a dean of the chapel at Duke years ago didn't tell anybody, but at some service, he stood up and read the prayer of Manasseh. And people were moved afterward and said, wow, where'd you get that prayer? Did you write it? No, I read it out of the Apocrypha. Because when you come to, uh, if you're looking for a prayer about repentance for your deeds, uh, it's kind of hard to argue with um, the conclusion of this, verses 13 through 15. I earnestly implore you, forgive me, O Lord, forgive me. Do not destroy me with my transgressions. Do not be angry with me forever or store up evil for me. Do not condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O Lord, are the God of those who repent. And in me you will manifest your goodness. For unworthy as I am, you will save me according to your great mercy. And I will praise you continually all the days of my life. For all the host of heaven sings your praise and yours is the glory forever. Amen. First Enoch is an interesting collection of some prophecies and end-of-the-world speculation, but part of the reason that First Enoch is, is important is because I gave you what we call a synopsis here in two columns. And the reason I translated this myself instead of grabbing somebody else's translation was because I wanted to bring out what you would have seen if you read this in Greek in both documents. Because each of the places where you have the same word on each side, it's the same word in Greek. So when you look at this passage from First Enoch about he comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and destroy all the ungodly, da -da 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 -da. Jude, in verses 14 and 15 of his letter, is quoting this. This is so close it's, you have to have an excuse to want to deny that this is a quote. And he identifies the author of this as Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesying about this. So whenever you discuss the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, you have to first of all explain why did you quote, quote this. Now the other companion piece of information you'll have to explain along with this is that Second Peter uses a lot of the book of Jude. But when he includes this material, Enoch's name doesn't appear. And it's not in any way identified as a quotation from a book by Enoch. So you have here not just an allusion to an idea, but you have a quote from one of these books. Now, if you look at a commentary on 2 Peter, You'll see there are multiple explanations for this. I'll give you my take on this in a couple weeks, but 
not something there's unanimity on. Let me go back to the Apocrypha for one other piece, which is a book called Fourth Ezra. It's found in the apocryphal book called Second Esdras. The book called Second Esdras in the Apocrypha is actually three different books attributed to Ezra put end to end. Fourth Ezra is the most important to New Testament scholars. There are a number of places where there are parallels into the New Testament. I'm not going to focus on those. <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on here in this particular excerpt is Israel, even though they are in the land, Israel still views itself as being in exile. Because while they haven't been kicked out of the land, they are still living under the boot of a foreign nation. They are not really their own masters and independent. Well, this raises the question of why do bad things happen to good people? What we call theodicy. Now, the writer of Fourth Ezra has a long passage on this topic. I've only given you a couple of verses because, you know, we don't have time for the whole section. He asks rhetorically, are the deeds of Babylon any better than those of Zion? Or has another no nation known you besides Israel? Or what tribes have so believed the covenants as these tribes of Jacob? Go back down to verse 35. When have the inhabitants of the earth not sinned in your sight? Or what nation has kept your commandments so well? You may indeed find individuals who have kept your commandments, but nations you will not find. Why, God, are you picking on us, though we're trying our best? This not only raises questions of God's justice, but it also raises questions about confidence in the covenant. So the idea that Jews might have thought of themselves as miserable sinners is not evidenced in a passage like this. These people are fairly confident of their status with God. That raises a number of questions for Romans, particularly Romans 2 and 3. The last passage, which is in the Old Testament Apocrypha, is a, sec is a section of the Odes of Solomon. The Odes of Solomon might be one of the earliest Christian hymnals, though it probably has, it has Semitic roots. This was probably written in Aramaic. The versions we have surviving are in Syriac, which is Spanish to Portuguese. Yeah, that's kind of the relationship between Hebrew on the one hand and Aramaic and Syriac on the other. The passage, if you come down to verses 6 and 7 and 8, In describing how the Most High has circumcised me by his Holy Spirit, verse 2, circumcision of the heart, anyone? In verse 5, I was established upon the rock of truth where he had set me, and speaking waters touched my lips from the spring of the Lord generously, and so I drank and became intoxicated from the living water that does not die. The parallels in here and a number of places in the Gospel of John to the Odes of Solomon are discussed by any competent commentator on John. Now, exactly how many of these things are just Jewish background? What of them are ideas that 
the Odes of Solomon may have picked out of the Gospel of John, or what places the Gospel of John may have taken ideas from and expanded on them, who knows? That's, that, that's a long, complicated question. But these are pieces that illustrate that gospel as well. So, any number of places in the Old Testament Apocrypha, there's stuff that, you know, you'll roll your eyes at. Some stuff you'll find really interesting. Some places you'll see parallels to the, to the New Testament. And again, I'm not as... I don't sell the Old Testament Apocrypha quite the same way I sell, sell these pseudepigrapha the same way I sell the Apocrypha. But if you're really, really serious about the New Testament, those are two good pieces to have on your electronic or physical bookshelf. So at this point, these were the books that were considered for the Hebrew Bible We've talked a little bit about how those books didn't make the cut. What we want to turn to next week is the New Testament canon. So I'll talk next week, first of all, about how the church went from oral tradition to written tradition and some of the stages of how the canon of the New Testament developed and some of the I'll touch briefly on some of the disagreements on some of the books, but that will really do in two weeks. So the New Testament next week, the New Testament Apocrypha the following week, so some more stories like this, except some really, really wild ones. And then final week on authorship and some of the latest later debates on which books are on the cusp and whether they should or shouldn't be in. Okay? Oh, the Gnostic Gospels will be the second week. Yeah, yeah. Part of the New, Te part of the New Testament Apocrypha. Oh, yeah, yeah. Apocryphal Gospels. Nag Hammadi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had one of my first classes in graduate school. I got a brand new copy of the translation of the... Of the, of the no, of, of the whole Nag Hammadi library that had just appeared like 12 months before I started graduate school. And so, yeah, it's been a whole course on Gnosticism. Fun. Okay, great, thanks. Do you have a list of the books that you would recommend for us? I will bring a list in.